here with Cindy Iadis, and she is with Flagman, uh, flagmansafety.com. And we're going to let her introduce herself and uh, kind of get the show rolling here. Uh, what she's a part of is so important, and she's, she's moving it forward so well. Uh, I'm, I'm, we're really looking forward to this show. So, Cindy, welcome to Toe Business Podcast. Thank you, Jeff, and thank you, Brad. Uh, it's so good to be here. Uh, I love every opportunity uh, to talk about Flagman and the Flagman mission. So uh, I'll just start with uh, telling you how Flagman came to be, because um, it wasn't on my radar a couple of years ago. But um, you know, I grew up in Fairfield, Connecticut, uh, in a tow family. Uh, my dad, my dad had Mickey's uh, auto body, and. Uh, all my brothers and sisters were raised to either be secretaries or tow truck operators. I, I got a one-way ticket to Hawaii because uh, I saw the writing on the wall and uh, ended up going to film school. So I'm a, I'm a media maker, a director, a uh, storyteller. And I've actually been working on a film about my father's rise to the International Towing and Recovery Hall of Fame called Tow It All, uh, which is in uh, post-production now. Um, so my father, uh, Russ Iodice, was, uh, you know, helped found the towing recovery professionals in Connecticut in 1980 with uh, six other local guys. Um, he was largely responsible for helping Connecticut, uh, you know, build the towing industry and um, was recognized in 1995, the first tow operator out of the state of Connecticut to be inducted into the International Towing and Recovery Hall of Fame which is, was just such a proud uh, accomplishment for my dad, right? The son of an immigrant. Um, my, my grandfather started a gas station after immigrating with his parents from Italy. And um, my dad, my dad talked my grandfather into buying him a tow truck in 1958, 57, 58. And, uh, and then he just taught himself how to use it, went around, told people what he could do with it. And, uh, and built this incredible uh, career and uh, family business. Um, so he raised my brothers, Corey, my oldest brother and Chris, uh, Chris took his driving test at Bridgeport DMV in a tow truck. <laughs> when he showed up, they're like, we, we've never done this before. Uh, but you know, got a tow truck for his high school graduation and, um, uh, my brothers and my dad, uh, were just incredible, you know, incredible, um, incredible people and incredibly capable and uh we did some interviews in connecticut with like the police department and the fire department and they said when the iodices uh showed up we knew everything was going to be okay so my dad built this incredible business and raised his sons particularly uh in it and uh corey uh corey started incorporating safety techniques in the 80s like before it was really a thing he 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 started devising ways to make himself safer up on i-95 in the Merritt parkway in connecticut and he started sharing his ideas and techniques with other tow operators and a lot of people have reported that uh you know corey would pull over and help them um uh, like on a heavy duty tow they didn't know what they were doing maybe on the side of the road or it was tricky. Um, so Corey started doing safety and then like made a little manual and started teaching other people safety. So uh, everybody was shocked uh, when Corey was struck and killed um, in on April 22nd, 2020 on the Merritt Parkway in Connecticut. Uh, we're devastated. Like we're still, we'll never, we'll never be the same uh, from this loss. And the most shocking thing I think for the towing industry was how could this happen to Corey, the guy that we had, you know, had been practicing safety all this time. And um, so many circumstances happened that day, right? It was the early pandemic. Um, things were closed. People were supposed to be home. Even golf courses were closed in Connecticut. And um, Chris had two calls that day. Uh, one was a, a post, post office truck uh, in Fairfield. And one was a, a friend of the family uh, who used to actually run his auto body business out of our shop called and said, hey, I've got a, I've got a customer broke down on the, on the Merit and um, I need you to go up there and get him. And so Chris said to Corey, what, you know, which one do you want? And Corey picked that job. And so Chris went out to get the post office truck and came back to the shop and, um, you know, the scanner was buzzing, you know, Chris and, Chris and Chris and his wife who uh, handles uh, the business with them, they'd called Troop G to say, hey, the Connecticut State Troopers to say, hey, we're Chris was like, I'm sending a guy up to the Merritt Parkway. And they were like, yeah, we're busy. Like, we can't, can't send anybody up there. Thanks for letting us know. And then uh, 
uh, you know, at some point the scanner was abuzz and um, the state police were uh, saying there was a fatality uh, up there on the Merritt and Chris knew it was in the area where Corey was. Um, and such a tragic, uh, difficult uh, time for Chris because nobody would tell him, even his friends who knew, nobody would tell him what was going on. And But people were telling him not to go up to the Merritt Parkway and um, and then the and then the state troopers, uh, they, they pulled into the shop, um, you know, to tell him. And then uh, Chris called his wife and he called me and, uh, and he said, I've got to, I got to cross the street and tell dad. My dad, uh, my dad was living in the house across from the shop. I got to, I got to go tell dad. Um, so, you know, our, our lives changed um, that day. Um, and the medical examiner said that there was nothing Corey could have done that day to save his own life because the, the guy that struck and killed him was weaving in and out of traffic. He had come off of Route 25. He was reported um, traveling uh, over the white line to pass cars on the entrance ramp. Um, you know, fortunately, I want to say seven or eight people um, came forward and gave statements of his erratic, um, scary behavior um, miles before the crash. And, um, and then people, of course, witnessed it. So, uh, you know, Merritt Parkway is two lanes. It's a scenic highway. Uh, there's a white line. Corey was well over the white line. He was up on the shoulder. Uh, there was the, the flatbed. And because of the pandemic, he had to tell the guy in the, the Mercedes, hey, I can't, I can't have you in the truck. You gotta, you know, they told him when Corey was heading up there, Kristen said, you gotta, you gotta get a ride. And so that guy's brother showed up in a Lexus and he pulled up behind uh, the Mercedes and uh, and those two guys were outside of their car and Corey walked over and said, you guys got to get in the car. It's not safe up here. And then went to work. And so while Corey was loading the Mercedes on the flatbed, um, this guy, Dean Robert, uh, came down the Merritt. And what was reported was that he was like in the inside lane and it wasn't fast enough. And they got behind the other lane. It wasn't fast enough. And he popped out, popped out to try to pass everybody over the white line. And... Um, uh, he was going 90 miles per hour, five seconds before impact. And, uh, you know, the cars were totaled. Um, Corey, the, 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 the BMW that he was driving came up the ramp, the flatbed. And um, that's where Corey was operating the controls. And that, that car, his car, the, the uh, Dean Robert car, landed like 150 feet down the road, overturned on its roof in a, in a small puddle. And because he was drunk, um, he was uninjured. So, uh, you know, so Chris crossed the street to tell my dad and, um, you know, that was the beginning of this uh, very difficult uh, reality for my family. Um, I got on a plane and uh, was in my brother's house, you know, within 24 hours and uh, stayed with my family for six weeks. But because of the pandemic, we couldn't have a funeral. The community couldn't come out. The first responders that my family had been working for with all those years could not come. Um, they gave us, they let us have 10. The priest wouldn't, the priest wouldn't even let us in the church. He, he only would come to the cemetery. And there was a lot of things that were happening um, that were really hard, really hard to process. Couldn't do our typical, um, you know, goodbyes to a family member. Um, they wanted to have a tow truck parade at that time, which Connecticut and, and the industry likes to do for their fallen heroes. And couldn't do that. Um, the, the police department was afraid that we would become targets of um, anger for people who couldn't even have funerals for their families, that kind of thing. So we buried Corey and um, uh, after six weeks there, I came back, uh, I came back to Hawaii and I started meeting with my creative team um, on Zoom and just said, we've, you know, we've got to figure something out. And he thought, is slow down, move over the right slogan? Do we need a new slogan? You know, like click it or ticket, like everybody knows what that means. Like what, what does, what do we need? Um, and we ultimately decided uh, our creative director, uh, one of our creative directors, Tony Apolato, is known for his work in New York back in the 70s. He actually came up with Ryu Needy on Ice is Nice and Let Your Fingers Do the Walking and Dial Lash Mascara. And, and Tony said, what if we animate Flagman right off the sign, this universally recognized uh, hazard guy, right? Everybody knows, uh, everybody knows a Flagman sign. Um, and so I was really excited, <laughs> yes. So I hired an animation team and the animation team sent me this 15 second clip where Flagman jumps off the sign, he runs into the road, and he does a little dance 
<laughs> next to a flatbed. And I was like, yes, yes. And so I <laughs> sent it to my nieces and I said, hey, what do you girls think of this? And they said, we love the way Flag Man jumps off the sign. And so I was like, okay, the kids already think it's cool. And, uh, and so we went out with uh, Kenny Tom from Advanced Towing in Honolulu and we shot our first PSA, right? So we set up, I was aware that we were setting up the scenario that in which my brother died. So that was really difficult. And we just set up this, um, the scene with a tow truck and a pickup truck. And we just started shooting some footage that we could incorporate Flagman into the roadside scenario. And we hired a voice actor and we made our first 30 second PSA. And uh, I remember sharing it with my dad and uh, my dad, my dad was just so thrilled. He was like, just keep your head down, Cindy, and keep going. Just keep doing what you're doing. Don't worry about what people think or say or whatever you're, you're you know, you definitely, you're definitely onto something. And, um, and then my dad got sick uh, and in October um, after, after Corey died and got into an ambulance in Fairfield right across from the shop and um, the hospitals were in crisis. Uh, Bridgeport Hospital. They had him in the ER at one point for 26 hours. And then they, I of course was there. They called me they said, come see your dad. And I get to the hospital and they said, no, you can't see him. He's restricted. And I was like, what does that even mean? And they're like, well, he's in a full COVID floor. I'm like, but, and I just burst out crying. I'm like, my dad doesn't have COVID. And they're like, he doesn't? And I was like, he doesn't have COVID. And uh, I like cried and like made them move him and they moved him within a couple of hours. But my dad ended up testing positive four days later. And, um, which was Thanksgiving weekend 2020 and he passed away a week before Christmas, which uh, was another huge devastating blow to my family, right? We've lost our two, you know, paternal leaders, our mentors, our, our, our heroes, you know, and um, had to go through the whole COVID funeral. And at that time, they, the Connecticut said, we're doing a parade uh, for Russ Idice. He's a legend in this industry and um, they closed down. <laughs> portions of I-95 and let us run from exit 21 all the way down to the state trooper G barracks and um, the uh, they were saluting outside and back to the cemetery and a lot of people a lot of tow trucks from New England um, remember Pennsylvania was there I know that's not New England but uh, Rhode Island Massachusetts Connecticut they came out to um, pay respects to my dad um, so really hard right really really hard losses but in my head, is my dad always saying, just just keep doing what you're doing, um, Cindy. So that's how Flagman was born. And um, you know, once we created the PSA, I sent it to my nieces again. My brother Chris has got uh, uh, two girls, and I think Maddie was 10 or 11 at the time. Jamie was maybe 15, and our other niece Lizzie was 13. And I said, "What do you think?" And they were like, "We love the way Flagman." Jumps on and off the sign, and we love that he's protecting Daddy out there on the road. And I thought, yes. Yes, we are going to educate not only the driving public, the future driving public and our children. And that was the first time that I realized that what's missing in the in the re responder industry at large is educating, educating, starting with our with our kids and um, before they ever get on the road. And so that's how Flagman came to be and uh, went down to Tennessee last year with my film crew. They memorialized Corey on the Wall of the Fallen. My father is inside the building in the Hall of Fame and my brother is now outside the building on the Wall of the Fallen, which is the first time in towing history um, that a father and son. My dad has the uh, recognition everybody strives to get. They call my dad and the guys in the Hall of Fame legends and the guys on the wall outside are called heroes. And so we went down to Tennessee. I uh, pitched Flagman to Miller. Um, we had the we had the 30 second PSA and some 2D artwork and a concept. I interviewed everybody associated with the towing, the International Towing Recovery Hall of Fame. So Bill Graziano, the current president, Jeffrey Godwin, Tom Tedford, um, Mike McGovern. We just interviewed a ton of guys down there. And then we went up to Connecticut and we interviewed Fairfield Police and um, other friends of Corey's and my dad's that could speak to slow down, move over, and also um, the legendary Iodice family in the towing industry. And, uh, and I came back to Hawaii and um, uh, started working on a business action plan. I hired an attorney first, and then she introduced me to a webmaster. And uh, we just put our heads down and just started working. So by uh, January, uh, we were able to launch the Flagman Safety website. And um, since then, 
we've been uh, just making great strides, you know, uh, that we're, we're a nonprofit, so heavily dependent on donations right now. I've got, uh, you know, like 30 grant applications in. Uh, we just became federal uh, vendors for the federal government, which means I can apply for federal money uh, for Flagman. And so Flagman is, is built largely on the concept that MAD developed 40 years ago. We are going to be a national organization. Flagman is going to be a nationally recognized icon for slow down, move over. And once we, once we hit every corner of the U.S., we're going international, you know, and maybe before that. Um, so we're, we're building a brand. And um, I wanted to share with you, uh, I, I, we've recently been working with Senator Blumenthal, who went down to D.C. Uh, with uh, Republican Senator Mike Brown from Indiana and started the conversation of having a national resolution uh, for a slow down move over day. And he did it in Corey's honor, which is incredible. And so we're getting support in the Senate and we're looking to establish a national day. But Senator Blumenthal's office is like, well, what is this education piece? And they wanted me to apply for a grant. And it forced my hand to figure out, well, what, what are we teaching the kids? You know. And so we came up with Flagman's colleagues. Oh, wow. Because we're not just, even though I'm from a tow family and we're leveraging 70 years in the towing industry, um, we are, Flagman is, is all inclusive. Everybody who works on our roadways, everybody who drives a car, rides in a car, will be driving a car in the future. We want them to see themselves in Flagman. And so we've got, in this photo, we've got DOT, hazmat, fire, uh, EMS, Flagman, tow, utility, police, and this police dog. And so the program, which I'm so excited about because it looks like we're launching this next year uh, in Connecticut in uh, Fairfield, uh, Fairfield, 16 public schools, 10,000 kids, is that somebody, so somebody from each of these agency, industry agencies will come into, uh, we're going to go into every elementary school, um, every middle school, every high school, and, uh, and they're going to interact with kids. And so they're going to come in their regular clothes and then they're going to put on their work gear and we're going to teach children who works on the side of the road, what they wear, what they drive, what they do, and how we can all help them get home safely. And so that's our primary mission. So, I mean, I, I've got to start off by saying, I, I don't even know how to explain how sorry I am for you and your family, uh, what you're going through uh, with this, but it was so encouraging to watch the smile come back to your face as you progressed into the story of Flagman. Uh, you just went through this painful, painful explanation of what happened. And as you started to talk about Flagman, that smile came back to your face. And that that's wonderful. That That's very encouraging uh, to be able to take something like that and move it forward into this. And if you're just listening to the audio side of this, the picture she was holding up, it was basically the Flagman character, but in every other uh, profession that might be up on the roadway fire, DOT, PD, all that good stuff. So the, the flagman character visually is just, it's, he's a cute guy, <laughs> you know, he's, he's, he's a cool guy jumping around and waving his flag and to have those other characters finish this out. Now it is pretty cool. Um, your family, you know, we, we talked before we got on the show, you know, I'm, I grew up just what, 20 miles North of you. Um, I worked at record service, uh, just, basically it well i guess two towns up um so i was i i was always aware of you guys and your family didn't really know you but my boss he he, he picked and chose who what other towing companies he would work with or speak well about you know he had his little feuds here and there but you guys mickeys came up in conversations a lot in, in a positive manner. So that was pretty cool. So that's, that was my awareness of you guys. Um, the year of the hundredth anniversary in uh, Chattanooga, I'm in the, uh, I just come walking out of the, uh, the hall of fame where you do the walkthrough and I see somebody standing there with a Mickey's shirt on. I think it was a Mickey's shirt or a hat. So I said, Oh shoot, Fairfield. And then I saw your dad come walking up to him. And I don't even know why or how I knew after all these years who he was, 
Wow. Right. So apparently I did meet him a few times and uh, I told him who I was and where I grew up and who I worked for. And we, we had a fun little chat there, well, maybe, maybe five, 10 minutes or so. Uh, so that, that was really neat. Um, so, so yeah, de definitely good people. I, I probably met your, your brothers at some point, just, just ran into them, just doing what we do. Um, the, when you're mentioning the nieces showing this to get the reaction from your nieces, isn't, isn't, isn't that like a great place to start with this education before they're even driving, make them familiar with this? Um, do you, do you have, um, so in Georgia, an officer was struck and killed and his wife lobbied very hard to get slow down, move over, put into the uh, uh, driver's manual here in Georgia. Okay. She said it was a done deal. It was approved. It was happening. I, my son's grown. I haven't seen an owner's manual in a long time, but when I ask new like teen drivers, if they're aware of slow down, move over, I'm not sure it's in the book, unfortunately. So, I mean, isn't that really where we have to start? Yeah. Well, very state to state. Cause I recently had a conversation uh, with Hawaii DOT and, um, and got confirmation that it is in the uh, driver's test. It's on the test and it's in the manual. It's like one paragraph. Um, but at least there's an introduction and a conversation about it. But when Corey died in April of 2020, what was hard about that month um, was that uh, Corey died on April 22nd and our niece, Jamie um, was turning, Chris's daughter was turning 16 on the 27th and my dad was turning 81 on the 28th and um, Jamie was uh, starting driver's ed. It was just such a difficult time. I remember thinking, we can't have the funeral on their birthdays. Like we have to, we have to like push Corey's burial out. We push it out till May 1st to try to protect this young girl from this, you know, lifelong memory of losing uncle Corey, who she was just so fond of. And um, so Jamie, who's very academic is now at the university of New Haven freshman year um, said that every day she went to driver's ed, she, she, she waited for it. She looked for it. She asked about it and it wasn't in, Connecticut's DMV um, manual for new drivers. So it's one of our goals, right? We not only want to get into every driver's manual around the country, we want to, Connecticut's got great billboard, um, great billboards, and it's got re great rest stops up on the highway. Um, we want to, we want to, we intend to do a, you know, public service announcement and marketing campaign. So what, if I get my way in 2023, if we get all the funds that we need, what we're going to do is we're going to launch a new PSA that we shot um, in June with Fairfield Fire, Fairfield Police, AMR, and Iodice Family Transport. Um, all those agencies came out uh, and gave us a day. They closed Bronson Road right underneath I-95 and let me shoot the next PSA. And so this PSA will speak to all the responders who are working together to clear a wreck. And then Fairfield Fire was like, do you want us, do you want us to rip the door off or the roof off? I was like, the roof, of course. <laughs> <laughs> and so they just gave me all these resources and uh, and I shot, a, I shot a commercial. We're at actually editing it now. It's gonna be the next one minute PSA. And so the goal is to get that on to uh, uh, television in Connecticut and Southwestern Connecticut. Uh, in the beginning of 2023, get on a billboard, um, get on the news. We have a lot of, we've had three press conferences in Connecticut and um, I was only there for one of them. I haven't had to leave Hawaii and uh, Flagman is taking off. So Senator Blumenthal had a press conference with Fairfield Fire and Fairfield Police to make a donation to Flagman. And uh, we now have a media page on flagmansafety.com where you can see all of our uh, national media coverage, including our press conferences. And then after the resolution uh, day, August 2nd, Senator Blumenthal wanted to meet with New Haven, uh, fire police, DOT, and the unions and have another press conference. So they did to announce we've, we've introduced this uh, resolution uh, to the Senate. Um, and so uh, now we have uh, television partners, right? Because we've done interviews and we've done these press conferences and we always invite the media. So we're gonna go back to our media contacts and get Flagman on TV, get him on the billboard. Get we want to get him in the little digital uh, at the gas station little digital window. Um, we want to get a, a short Flagman commercial in there, and then my hope is that we're going to be able to launch the educational uh, 
the K through 12 uh, education pilot program to Fairfield 16 schools. And so today I'm submitting my grant app with Connecticut DOT and NHTSA who are offering um, to help me launch the campaign and to help fund the print materials. And um, we'll know that, uh, you know, if we've got that in the next couple of weeks. It looks very favorable that we're gonna get that grant money. And then by the time we go into the schools in April, the, there'll be some exposure to Flagman. And so we'll do a sort of a, a pre-assessment of kids. Who's Flagman? What do you know? What does he do? Who are all these other uh, responders that work on the side of our roadways? And then we're gonna run our program and then we're gonna do a post-assessment so we can uh, do a system of metrics and see what our impact is and if we need to make any changes and then we're gonna scale up. Um, so part of that program will be a poster contest for the kids. Uh, going to try to get a wall at Fairfield Library, uh, a wall in the elementary schools, the junior high school kids. I want to run a poster contest and I want to secure a wall on the I-95 rest stop in Fairfield North and Southbound and get a slow down move over wall. And for the high school kids, we'd like to run a um, billboard uh, competition to secure a billboard right there at the, like at the Fairfield there's one in Fairfield right by exit 25, right by the shop actually, where Mickey's was all these years to see if you can run a billboard competition. So yeah, getting into the DMV and all these other things, getting into the Waze app, like we have a lot of, uh, we have a lot of visions um, and goals for Flagman in order to help us scale up. That's good. Yeah, I uh, I was with Tom Parbs and uh, like George at the show right what? after he was at the press conference with you. I actually <laughs> talked to him this morning and mentioned we were going to be talking with you today, and, and uh, he was pretty excited for us. He's a great he's yeah. a great supporter. We he gave a great uh, uh, a testimony at the podium post sentencing. Uh, he's an industry leader. Uh, we are we're like the uh, uh, we just look at him with the uh, big eyes and trying to follow his lead. Uh, the Haas Alert has created a lot of inroads um, and has made tremendous progress and has. Uh, has already been saving lives with their, um, you know, with their device and, uh, they're amazing. Yeah. Oh, that's so, that makes me excited. And by the way, when you saw my dad at the hundred year anniversary, we were filming, uh, tow it all. That's why my dad was there. We, I brought my dad to Tennessee. Really? <laughs> I actually filmed the parade. We were the only ones filming the parade. I don't know why they didn't have local media filming the parade, but I filmed the parade from the Marriott, uh, where the tow show was on the second floor is where my camera was. And then we had a camera down on the road. Yeah. yeah. So uh, I was there too. Just, just, uh, I think I just used my phone, but <laughs> And then I regretted for so long not sending one of our trucks up there. We were so close here in Atlanta. And I just oh. didn't, I don't know why, I just didn't realize it was going to be the magnitude oh. that it, it reached, you know? And, uh, but yeah, that's funny. I, I saw a funny look on your face when I mentioned that I saw him down there at that time. And I guess that's why, right? You were there all. I'm going to look at my footage because you're probably in it. <laughs> Could be. Could be. <laughs> the, uh, I, I'm looking at the website and it's pretty cool because it's laid out exactly how you're talking, you know, mm -hmm. develop key partnerships, launch the pilot safety campaigns, K through 12. Uh, if you haven't been to flagmansafety.com, go there. Cause it, it, it's very well done. Uh, got a really cool old Mickey's truck in the background there. Mm -hmm. uh, but you know, the, the whole page, it's just very clear. It, it spells out the message very well. And uh, it's got all your, your uh, sponsors and partners down here scrolling across. I mean, it's, it's really, really gaining some momentum, it, it, which is awesome because uh, Brad and I, since we started the show three, four years ago, we, we both discussed the frustration we have with, you see a lot of towers mm -hmm. arguing to each other about how important slow down move over is and people aren't paying attention and this and that. And it's like, we've got to figure out how to take this outside of our industry. Mm -hmm. We've, we've got to get this out. And like, so I say, you know, talk to your friends, talk to your family, so spread the message. And there comes frustration number two for me because they look at me like I've got three heads when I start discussing it. And all I can figure is with them not being in our world, mm -hmm. working in the roadway, they have no concept. And, and, one family member said to me, I, I just, I just, it wasn't from a place of not caring or being mean. She, she just said, I don't get it. 
nobody's just deciding to drive across the line and, and, and strike a worker. I don't understand why you have to have this move over law. I said, well, that's the problem. Nobody's trying to do it and it's still happening. Mm -hmm. Nobody's trying to, to, to cross that white line, but it happens again and again and again. And when you start giving them the statistics, uh, the frequency of these accidents, they think you're nuts. They're like, no, that, there's no way. There's no way that's happening. So part of why I'm so excited about what you're doing here is it, you could just look at the website and your social media and see you're starting to push this message out far beyond just the towing industry. That, 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 I can't tell you how excited I am about that because I, I, I feel like this will finally make a difference. Yeah, well, thank you. Thank you for recognizing that uh, we are uh, getting a tremendous amount of support. Now, first of all, uh, Senator Blumenthal going on camera and saying, I think Flagman um, has the uh, legs for a national campaign and I support it. Um, he's given us several interviews. He's championing um, Flagman, which is important and uh, getting it to the US Senate and getting a national uh, move over, slow down, move over day is really important. Um, of course, we hope that day is uh, April 22nd, um, but I know there have been a lot of people uh, trying to make a difference and raise awareness and slow down move over long before Flagman was born. We're just happy to be in the conversation and at the table, and I admire and respect everybody who's doing anything to raise awareness because I think everything matters and everything's important and you never know uh, who and when you're going to reach um, somebody. So last night, the Connecticut Police uh, uh, Commission Association had a dinner to honor uh, police chiefs and other officers throughout Connecticut. And they asked us to send them our new trifold brochure, which mimics the website. It's, it, it, you know, this is our, this is the brand that we're developing and uh, uh, has, you know, Corey on the back and uh, a little bit about our story. We have a QR code. We have a, we have, we have a custom QR code with flag band right in the middle, uh, which our logo is right in the middle, which I'm really excited about. And so last night they handed out 250 of these in Connecticut. And this past weekend, uh, ERSCA, Emergency Road uh, Service Coalition of America, which is like the Towing and Recovery Association uh, they, they, they do the same thing, right? They represent the industry, but ERSCA is so much more. They're out there training and um, they're a partner of Flagman. So they wanted to hand these out at the Las Vegas Tow Show. So we sent them a, a shipment and they're also taking Flagman to Tennessee, which is next week, and then Baltimore. Um, and uh, oh, I wanted to tell you, Jeff, that I got this message through the Flagman safety website from uh, a driver from Bruno's. Do you remember Bruno's? Absolutely. So Ted contacted me over uh, last week and he said, I, I really want to talk to you. I, I was in downtown Milford um, and there were, it was a two car crash, right? And we're talking about like a post road, right? We're not talking about a highway. There were two police cars behind him and two car crash in front of him. And the minute he opened his door, he got hit and fortunately uh, he was uninjured. Um, the door was open about six inches when a car plowed into the scene. And um, Ted called me um, because he said, I've got five kids and that call to my, my wife would have been a call to my widow and it could have ended so much uh, more tragically. And um, like me, like when Corey was killed, all of a sudden like my driving changed my awareness. I don't take phone calls in my car. I don't, I don't get on Zoom. I don't do anything in my car but drive. And I've been consciously working on that, uh, especially with the introduction of cell phones. But when Corey died, uh, I now like people want to talk to me all the time while they're driving. And I'm like, you know what, call me when you get home or get to your office. I cannot engage in distracted driving um, and run a flag man, slow down, move over safety campaign. But uh, so Ted um, asked for um, a shipment of brochures. Um, so he's distributing them in East Haven, West Haven, and New Haven. And um, there's a guy out in Pennsylvania who survived um, being hit, uh, John Deweese. Um, he is 
uh, been doing TikToks and promoting Flagman. He goes to all the toe shows. Um, so Flagman is getting out there as a national uh, brand and it's exactly what it needs, right? I wanted to share with you that I recently uh, did a walk, walk like mad with mad. Um, and on my own, I hadn't really separated out the fact that Corey was killed by a drunk driver uh, in addition to somebody who failed to slow down and move over. And so the walk was very difficult for me. I was surrounded by um, victims, um, survivors of uh, other drunk drivers, um, but we did a walk. And Mad is a partner of Flagman. And when I got an email from Mad back in February or March saying, oh my God, we love what you're doing and we want to be a partner. Um, how, how can we work together? I, I just cried. You know, so we're we're partners with Mad AAA, uh, AAA New England, AAA SoCal, AAA National, um, all who've made donations um, to help us move forward. And obviously, we have DOT, uh, Erska, ATSA. Um, ATSA is another longtime uh, traffic uh, safety awareness group um, that's that we're working with. So. Yeah, it, it's going to take like what Mad had at that event was just tons of volunteers running the whole thing. And I thought that's exactly what Flagman needs. These responders were going to need to volunteer in their communities and go into every school because what is going to make this stick? The impression is going to be the interaction between a fireman, a policeman, a DOT, a tow operator, and students. That's what they're going to remember from the, uh, the Flagman educational outreach program. Um, so. Yeah, we it's a we need to rally, and you know the kind of support we need right now is I'm not sure. So we're getting a lot of traffic. Um, uh, look, Jeff, if I post an old Mickey's video, which I just did at exit 19 when the Ford was rolling down the highway, that beautiful photo. We have a ton of archival footage in my family. There was always a camera at these big wrecks, which is what total uh, will feature. But whenever I post that, those, <laughs> everybody's on there, it gets the most views. That video in one week got like 600 views. And so I'm using the old Mickey's archival footage to drive people to the Flagman site. But what's not happening is people are not signing on for the Flagman newsletter and are uh, somehow sitting on the sideline waiting to see what we do. And what we need is we need people to sign on for the newsletter. We need people to repost, help us get the word out there. And of course we need donations and everything matters, every donation. There was a, a check donated last night at that event, uh, which I didn't know was gonna happen, was surprised and they said, we stand with Flagman. That's our rallying call. We stand with Flagman, I stand with Flagman. Um, and so that's the kind of support we're looking for right now. Look, I'm gonna, with or without money, I'm gonna keep going and um, I'm pretty heavily invested. I didn't think it was gonna cost the kind of money it would cost to get me here, but I figured if I build it, they'll come. And so now I need I need everybody to show up. But we're heavily supported by fire unions, police, uh, DOT, tow, um, and we're always expanding and want everybody to see themselves in flagman safety, whether they're uh, a motoring public, a future motoring public, a uh, highway safety worker, or a first responder. Flagman is for everybody, and uh, we you know we're going to need support and just armies of volunteers around the country to help us scale up. And uh, I can't wait till we all see Flagman on TV for the first time. <laughs> Fantastic. Hi. Uh, yeah, we, we, uh, you mentioned Erska. I mean, they, they, they're doing fantastic work. Uh, yeah. we've had Quinn and, and, uh, Oh, you have Steve and, uh, Twice, two people. or three times. Yeah. Yeah. They've been on here several times. I'm actually on the, uh, federal legislative board with them and, uh, they, they, what a, what a great bunch of guys and everybody there, uh, they're good to have on your side, obviously. Um, well, we want to grow together. And that's what Quinn said. He said, we're new, you're new, let's grow together. And uh, I couldn't uh, be happier and prouder of the relationship with Erska. I mean, they're, they're just, uh, they're industry leaders and, uh, and, they, and they care about the industry across the country. Uh, they're a coast to coast organization for sure. So, so I, I kind of joked with you in an email about us never doing show prep, but this, <laughs> this to me was, too important not to do some prep. And I read a few things. One of them was your family has had, you've had a longstanding relationship with MAD, right? Yeah, my dad, my dad would, uh, yes, yeah, absolutely. You, you did pull that up. Yes, yes. 
you know, my dad, my dad, my dad, you know, I don't, I wish you knew my dad and, uh, or knew him more than you did because uh, he uh, just has a reputation of being a, a legend and a really big hearted guy. You know, he, uh, I, we interviewed Bobby uh, Barbieri from Chippies in uh up in uh ansonia and bobby said that my dad gave him his first heavy duty truck and he said you need to learn how to be in the heavy duty field and uh and bobby forever grateful for the generosity of my dad but my dad had a long-standing partnership with mad in connecticut and the fairfield fire uh department they would do trainings on the grounds my dad corey and chris uh you know saved a couple of lives on 95 and were recognized and when we were shooting at the fire department recently uh, we were standing in the same place that my family was recognized for saving lives, which I thought was really cool. So yeah, the relationship with Matt is longstanding. And uh, I don't know if national, <clears throat> if the national Matt organization recognizes that, but at the New Haven press conference, um, Bob Gargiuli from uh, regional Matt in New England um, came out and spoke on behalf of Matt at the uh, press conference with Senator Blumenthal. So yeah, yeah. Thank you for reminding me that. I feel like I feel like uh, I'm in a position to continue the work that my dad and my brothers have done in Connecticut to keep the motoring public safe. And, uh, you know, my one-way ticket to Hawaii, I always regretted missing the great, uh, the great era of Mickey's. Um, but now I'm back to tell their story and I see that I'm able to carry their legacy forward with the work that I do. So it, it all worked out. That, that is fantastic. Hey, did, did, uh, did Blumenthal approach you or did you approach him? Well, I sent an email. I sent an email. Uh, I emailed the White House. Look, <laughs> I emailed the White House. I emailed Secretary Buttigieg. Uh, I, I email everybody, and uh, a lot of my emails go unanswered. Um, but in in his case, it didn't. And it just so happened that when I reached out to Senator Blumenthal, he was going to uh, speak with Secretary Buttigieg about two things. One was seatbelt safety for kids, car seat safety for kids. And the other was slow down, move over. And it literally was the day before he went down there. And so we, Senator Blumenthal was on C-SPAN. You can find it on the Flagman Safety website, talking to Secretary Buttigieg about the loss of Corey, which I, Chris and I, when we watched that, we just cried. We were on C-SPAN before the court hearing uh, in Bridgeport, on which was June 2nd. And so uh, he went, so that was in May. And then I think it was May 9th. And then I said, can I come to Hartford and interview Senator Blumenthal? And they said, yes. And then I said, would Senator Blumenthal come to a press conference that I want to hold post-sentencing at Bridgeport, uh, Golden Hill Street? And they said, yes. And uh, well, we've been in a partnership ever since. Wow. That is, that is fantastic. I mean, those are the people you need on, on your team. Well, look, you know why I contacted Senator Blumenthal was because I, I watch News 12 right here from Hawaii. It's the, only, it's the only station I can get live regularly. And I was watching uh, Senator, I've seen him a ton of times, right? He comes out for the everyday people of Connecticut and he was sitting in a house in Bridgeport. There was no electricity. The woman was on dialysis. She was getting evicted. And he said, this is not okay. And I thought there is somebody who uh, shows up for the people and uh, he's really good. And I learned when I was uh, waiting for him in his office that he literally hopscotch hopscotches the state all day long when he's not down in DC and he shows up for all kinds of events. And uh, the day of the sentencing, which was largely disappointing by the way, I was hopeful we had a woman judge, a woman prosecutor, a woman uh, a victim's advocate. And I was so hopeful. And by the way, Chris Russell was struck and killed 10 days before Corey's, before our court date in, uh, in, in North Haven, another tow operator shockingly killed. And I thought this is a perfect opportunity for the court to set a precedence. And, um, and, and, and they failed. They, 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 they literally failed um, to, to set the bar high um, because Dean Robert was sentenced to four and a half years and 30 days concurrent for drunk driving, which makes no sense to me. And then, um, and even when I got out to the podium for the press conference, Senator Blumenthal had waited for me for 45 minutes in the rain because um, the, the court went long. And um, I couldn't even articulate when I was at the podium what just happened there because it was really hard to understand. Um, and the next day, the Department of Justice sent me an email and said, oh, just so you know, he'll get five days off a month for good behavior. And, and then shortly after that, our attorneys uh, let me know that they were notified that Dean Robert will be up for parole in two years and uh, eligible to go to a halfway house. 
Um, and that, uh, so it was, a, it was a letdown. Fortunately, somebody told me to lower your expectations in court, but Senator Blumenthal has offered to make stronger legislation um, for Sun and Move Over because it literally was a slap on the wrist. And, you know, Jeff, I don't know if you know this, but like Bill Graziano from O'Hare's Towing, right? He's the president of the International Towing Recovery Hall of Fame Board. January 1st, 2020, so just months before Corey, um, Bill lost a driver. And um, oh, so, so tragic. And uh, we interviewed him when we were in Tennessee last fall. And he told me that the woman who was drunk and ran over his 22 year old driver um, got a slap on the wrist. Um, and so there's a lot of work to be done because often um, the the offenders who fail to slow down and move over are under the influence or not um, are getting off with uh, minimal punishment, if any. Do you, do you feel that the fact that he was impaired, um, did that possibly help him? Like give him some sort of excuse for what happened? I'll tell you what, I'll tell you what happened is the defense was that this guy, Dean Robert, has had uh, been suffering with untreated mental health issues for, for decades. And like they did a psych evaluation, which I read and it, he just was blaming his father for leaving him, his mother for remarrying, his mother for moving him. Uh, his first wife, his second wife, like he just was blaming everybody. And I thought this guy's not taking responsibility. But that day in court, their whole thing was, well, look, he was untreated and he's treated now and he's going to be better. And really it took the striking and killing my brother um, for this guy to get help. And that was their defense. And there was a mandatory court break, 15 minutes between sort of all the victim statements. The prosecutor she just lobbed it to the judge. She's like, well, he was drunk, but he wasn't that drunk. And I just like wanted to choke her. And then she just sort of lobbed it to the judge. And then we took a 15 minute break. And on the break, the defense's family walked over to the defense table. And mind you, this was a, uh, this was a, uh, you know, we had already agreed in advance that um, this wasn't a, a, this wasn't a hearing. This was just a sentencing. Like he agreed to plead guilty. So they walked over with a brown bag and they removed um, prescription drugs and set them on the table in front of him. And I thought, what am I on TV? Like, this is so theatrical. It was to reinforce that this is an untreated guy who's now treated and he's going to, and he's going to be and do better going forward. And kind of that excuse is what he did. It was terrible. It was like, uh, the judge had already, she already knew what she was going to decide before that day. And it felt very, um, stage. Like everybody had a role in that courtroom. Like they had like eight or 10 or 12 bailiffs and they it just was such this weird it was it was just such this weird uh experience it just felt very rehearsed and that we were yeah we got to read our statements but um i don't think we were heard you know or any of what we said was taken into consideration and by the way i submitted almost 50 letters um from people across the country who were saying you need to you need to punish this guy and, and um, this is a thing. And uh, she said she reviewed everything, but I didn't feel like that she read any of our letters. Um, and of course, you know, we had a lot of first responders there and um, sitting in, and actually Tom was there, which was great. And um, I just felt like uh, the decision had been made before court. So that was, a, that was a letdown, but it showed me that there's a lot of work to do, right? So yes, we're going out to educate the children, the driving public, the future drivers, the, you know, the responder industry, but literally, you know, laws need to change and there needs to be a national uprise to make a difference. So at the sentencing, do you know, like where, what he ultimately got? Where did that fall between minimum sentencing and maximum sentencing? Right. That's a great question. Um, so the discussion was that he was going to get six years and even six years would have been too little. But I was like, OK, well, I went into court that day believing that he was going to get six years. Um, the max is 10. He was never going to get the max. And Connecticut slow down move over law doesn't carry any jail time. And a week before that day in court, I finally got to talk to the prosecutor because I found out that I could. And she told me that she was going to recommend to the judge that uh, Dean Robert get a $250 fine. 
for uh, the slowdown move over violation. And I said, $250 is when you injure somebody or you create an accident. It's not for the death of. In Connecticut, if you kill somebody, the punishment is up to $10,000. So I did, through our attorney, contact the judge and say, look, this is a slowdown move over opportunity. We've created Flagman um, to create this national movement. And please, please, please give him the full extent of the law under the current slowdown move over law in Connecticut, which was $10,000. So a victory that we had uh, was that he is ordered to pay Flagman safety $10,000. The surprising part of that victory is he's not, he doesn't have to make a payment until he's on probation, which if he stayed in jail for four and a half years, we're talking about four and a half years before his first payment. And the way it, it was um, uh, structured is that he'll pay $2,000 a year for five years, which look, I'm happy for any money to flag man. Um, but I have a lot more money than that invested in this project. And uh, Dean Roberts uh, doesn't, Robert doesn't have to make a payment until he's done his jail time and is back home with his family. So yeah, 10 years would have been the max. They said he'll never get the max. So then I was like, okay, well, if six years is the most, then let's just do that. And so when, he, when the, the sentencing was four and a half years, I was shocked. And 30 days for DUI concurrent, which means it's not four and a half years plus 30 days, it's four and a half years. Yeah, very disappointing in the, in the justice system. In, in and Chris, Chris Robert or Chris uh, Russell, well, his family will have a day in court too, and that's the precedent. And, and to me, one of the things that just stood out in what you said was when he gets home to his family. Yeah, and he will get yeah. home to his family. You guys, you guys will never be able to experience that. And can I just tell you, Jeff, that one of the cases that the judge considered when considering this case was in Fairfield on Reading Road, uh, two road, two lane road, very narrow, um, very kind of rural, um, Greenfield Hill, a off duty uh, volunteer firefighter from Easton, uh, right after, uh, sometime after Corey died, I wanna say it was like 4th of July, I think it was 4th of July, was uh, struck and killed a woman who was walking her dog, who was visiting family for the holiday and left the scene like his side mirror took her out and uh, he left her there and he was drunk and because the mirror of his big ford whatever was on the side of the road they were able to track him down and uh, and he pled guilty and he got six years and so that was where the conversation started that looking at that case as some kind of comparison uh, to what corey to what corey went through and then another case or two that had minimal jail time is what she referenced. And I was saying, no, make this the slow down move over example going forward. So this never happens again. And so when Chris Russell was killed, I was like, oh my God, she's got to do something important today. And, and I just felt like she didn't. So what's going to happen to Chris Russell's case? Another, uh, by the way, that was another hit and run. Um, and that driver was located, I think in New Hampshire left Chris Russell on the side of the road. And by the way, Chris Russell, it wasn't a, he wasn't on the police list rotation and it was a call. He was driving home to Enfield, I believe. And he stopped to help a, a stranded motorist and he was struck and killed. Uh, you know, um, in, in Georgia in 2003, we got the slow down move over law passed and it was a fine of $500, $500. Um, about a year or two into it, there was so much public outrage over $500 that they changed it to up to $500. What? Yes. Up to $500 for a slow down move over violation. Um, there, there's a local judge that I run into at breakfast every once in a while. And, and I asked him, so, so my, my son had to attend traffic court one day and uh, <laughs> he, uh, he comes back and he's like, dad, I saw multiple people charged with slow down, move over. And every one of them was dismissed. Oh my goodness. One person had to pay the fine. It, it was like two or three people that he saw before he had to, 
get up there and, and do his thing. Um, so when I run into this judge the next time, I sat down and had a conversation with him. You know, why are, why are they being let go? Why is this not being enforced? He says, I can't enforce it. He says, in most cases, I can't enforce it because there's like, there's like no proof. He says, the second someone comes in here and tries to fight it, it's very hard for me to make that charge stick because they're, where's the video? Where's the witnesses? Where was it? Uh, one of them, one of them he mentioned was uh, the, the, he actually felt the police officer was improperly parked at the entrance of a school. And he, he said, really, this initially came out of the way the police officer was parked. It made it very difficult for this guy to move over and slow down. So he, he said, our, our law just has no teeth in it. There's, it's, it's very hard to enforce here. So we, we've, uh, we've got a lot of work to do down here. And five hundred dollars. Now, to put it in perspective, you know, when when I run up through connect, okay, my sister, my sister, just I'm not talking on my phone in the car. She 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 feels like if she actually grabbed her phone and went to use it, she feels that's when a Connecticut state trooper is going to pull up next door, and she's like, I'm not doing it. There's no reason for it. It can wait till I get home. The fines are pretty steep up there. Mm -hmm. And you've got, you run, you're running through upstate New York and there's, they, they were kind of clever. They renamed their rest stops, um, texting stops, right? Really? I felt that was pretty cool. Cause now you're getting it in people's heads as they're going down, they're passing these signs. Oh, I gotta, I gotta, I gotta text somebody. Shoot. There's that sign. I'll pull in there and do it. You know, I feel like that kind of plants the seed in people's head you know what, this can wait a few minutes. I'll pull into the next stop and do this. Uh, but again, in New York, your third, your third cell phone violation is, uh, is a suspended license. And I think it, I think it goes like, I don't know, like a thousand dollars, then 1500, then 2000, you know, whatever the fines are, they're much greater than ours. And then you, you're faced with license suspension too. Mm -hmm. And it's like, the reason I'm bringing up the cell phone stuff is you can't compare the fines and the sentences down here in this area compared up there. You, they seem to take it more serious and put more teeth into their, their laws up there than we do down here. Mm -hmm. um, so we, we've got a, we've got a big uphill battle here in Georgia and, and probably around the South in general, because it just, that stuff's just looked at differently for some reason. Um, equally dangerous, no matter right. where you go. But yeah, I think it's, uh, you know, you're, uh, wow, um, I'm sad to hear that. Uh, it just feels like there's so much work to do um, collectively and that we all need to unite and, um, and keep trying to move forward as a unit. I, I'd reached out to like the Tennessee Highway Patrol because I know Miller Industries um, down there in Ottawa. <laughs> we got to go, I got to go spend the day there. They let me operate <laughs> a rotator. <laughs> An 80 ton rotator. I called my brother. I was like, look at me. Like dad would never believe this. Right. <laughs> I, they, they let me lift some stuff uh, right out in front of Miller. Um, but they were telling me, uh, Jeff Bagley and Will Miller, um, when we interviewed them, they were telling me that the Tennessee Highway Patrol runs slow down move over um, like, tra like, like traps, like speed traps uh, right out there in front of Miller um, to educate the driving public. And um, I, I think we need more of that. Um, I, I saw some stats recently. Another state was running some, you know, Pennsylvania is very progressive. Uh, I don't know if you know Todd Lees um, from uh, Responder Safety, those guys, um, they're, they're trying to be, uh, they are a repository for information. So if somebody is struck or injured or struck or killed, they want the report to come to them because they, they, there's not a national database, right? What's reported at the International Towing and Recovery Hall of Fame uh, is not often uh, reflective of the reality of the numbers. So the true numbers for injuries and deaths is still elusive, but emergency responder, um, uh, sorry, respondersafety.com, these guys are very progressive. They do a lot of training. They offer a lot of education materials, but they offer an opportunity for anybody who struck or injured or struck or killed to report to them. And so Todd Lease, L-E-I-S-S, -S, is on social media and he'll put up every time there's another death. And so there was just a death, number 36 this year. When Corey was killed, it was uh, 44. The next year it was 40, 
uh, the next year, let's see, it was 44, 46, the year Corey was killed, 2020. Um, last year, it was 65 first responders across the country, and right now we're at 36. And um, I think there has been, it feels like there's been a little bit of slowdown uh, in terms of um, fatalities. But the most recent one was like a, uh, there's been quite a few in New York, but the most recent was in Pennsylvania. It was a DOT worker operating a payloader who ran over a police officer in a roadside construction. Um, so uh, yeah, national awareness. There's organizations like Responder Safety that are, are making a difference in ERSC, of course. Like, look, we're all trying to come together and work together and figure out a way to get out there. And I don't know what it's going to take to get the laws uh, strengthened across the country. But like, look, MAD doesn't have a national law for MAD. MAD is state to state. And if MAD can't do it, how can we do it? But maybe we can do it. Maybe we can get a national movement when we get a national day and get some, uh, some national legislation. But um, got to be stricter penalties. There's got to be more enforcement. There's got to be more educational outreach and awareness because AAA did a study um, saying that people aren't aware of a slowdown move over law and those who are don't think it's a big deal whether they move over or not. Because like I said, like my family member said, people don't just randomly go over the white line, right? Brad, Brad what's the uh, slowdown move over law climate in Ohio? Penalties. About the, about like the same as everywhere else. Okay. You know, not widely discussed. A couple of signs here and there. Very under-enforced. Mm -hmm. um, they'll do a pop-up blitz like you just mentioned Tennessee does. Um, it'll get a bunch of bunch of attention, and then it goes away, and you don't hear about another one for a long time. So I think the problem is also the legislation is written very poorly, like Jeff mentioned, and not really enforceable, not measurable. Mm -hmm. So that's part of the problem on enforcement. And I think they get discouraged a lot of times when they know they can't enforce it, then they don't even really try to um, you know, pull people over or write citations or whatever. So the fact that it's state by state, not a federal, federal, uh, um, uniform legislation is, is, is a problem, obviously. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't need, I want to thank you so much for coming on here. I want to thank you so much for what you're doing. And, and flag man comes out of such tragedy and it's so important. And, and, you know, you don't always know why certain things gain traction when others don't, because obviously this movement's been around forever, right? We, we all preach it. We've been preaching it forever, but I feel this is finally getting traction and, and, and that's, Fantastic. And I thank you for everything you're doing. Again, so sorry for your family's loss. Um, and, and really, if you can give us that 30 second pitch again, uh, flagmansafety.com, donate, volunteer, all that good stuff. What, what have you got to close us out? Yeah. Well, a couple of things. One is uh, I wanted to tell you that after uh, our first, uh, we got our first PSA done, my niece is called like the next day. They're like, auntie, we just saw Flagman on the side of the road. I was like, oh, yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. How great. How great is that? Um, and also, I wanted to tell you that when we were in Tennessee for the tow show last year, uh, you know, Flagman was an idea. Uh, we didn't, we didn't, we didn't, we just, we got our EIN number. October 28th of 2021. So we're not even a year old, which is remarkable. And then we got our official recognition by the IRS um, before Corey's court date, which was amazing. Um, so yeah, we're new, but we're, um, look, I'm not going to stop. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to always follow my dad's word. Just keep doing what you're doing, um, Cindy. And uh, this is a rest of my life project, you know, and the kind of support we need right now is just people to believe in our mission. Look, if you're interested in saving lives of first responders and your loved ones, um, you know, I'm hoping that people can get the message and get on board. Um, like when Ted called me from Bruno's and said, oh my gosh, this happened. I said, yes, Ted, but how do we reach people before they go through what you're going through? How do we reach people? So that's our mission. So, um, you know, like our page, uh, sign up for our newsletter, make a donation, pr help promote us. You, you can contact me. I'll send you flyers, posters, whatever you want. Um, we're constantly uh, building the brand. You know, we're highly focused right now on the pilot education launch 
And, uh, you know, before we launch in Connecticut, we're already going to know where we're going next. So I want to mention that I saw that General Motors and Honda have zero injuries and deaths. I know Honda specifically has an initiative, zeros and injuries and deaths by 2050. And General Motors is working on a zero injuries and death initiative. And we are hoping to partner with those organizations um, who are industry leaders in transportation um, to help further our mission. Um, but you know, we we need a ton of help. And if you if if it feels uh, important in your heart, you know, reach out to flagmansafety.com. Reach out to flagmansafety at gmail.com. I'm on the other end of all correspondence, and I I'm always happy to have a Zoom call, a meeting, a pitch. I'm always happy to talk about the important work that Flagman is doing and joining others in the slowdown move over arena. And uh, together we can. And uh, I stand with Flagman, and I hope you stand with Flagman too. Stand with Flagman. Flagman.com. Get involved, please. This is so important. Uh, Cindy, thank you so much. And uh, I, I've got a feeling we're going to be talking again soon. Thanks, Jeff. And thank you, Brad. I really appreciate your time and uh, the opportunity uh, to talk about our collective goal of zero injuries and deaths. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thanks right. again.